Hello, Room 19. I'm excited to be continuing Blood on the River. We are now on Chapter 15. Now in Jamestown, they were all in combustion, the strongest preparing once more to run away with the penance from England. William Simmons, The Proceedings. The discovery bobs in the river as the gentlemen on board unfurl her sails. There is no wind yet, but their intent is clear. They have loaded up all of our food, and as soon as a breeze lifts, they will set sail for England. There are 10 or 12 gentlemen on board, and they are leaving the 25 of us commoners behind to starve. In twos and threes, men come out from the fort to stare at the discovery. I'll shoot them all, one of the soldiers declares. He prepares to load his musket. Don't be stupid, Henry says. They'll shoot you before you can fire a second shot, and they'll hit some of the rest of us as well. They've already killed us, says John Layden. You think we'll make it through the winter? The river will freeze over our fishnets. The birds are already gone, and there's nothing more to harvest. We might as well be shot. At least there'll be a quick death. My stomach grumbles for its breakfast. I wonder how long it takes to die of hunger. I wonder if it hurts. The men continue to argue soon. Some of think we'll be able to trade with the Indians, and others insist that the Indians will not trade now, in midwinter, when they are probably going half-hungry themselves. Many want to kill the gentlemen, or die trying. <laughs> Reverend Hunt is standing near me. He is staring out at the ship, his face set in grim lines. Is it all lost, Reverend? I ask him. Are we doomed? He puts his hand on my shoulder. Do you see any wind? He asks. I take a good look at the surface of the river. River, There is hardly a ripple. I shake my head. Then the discovery is not going anywhere yet. There is time for me to pray for a miracle. He walks off in the direction of the fort to the chapel. I listen to the men argue how to shoot to kill the most gentlemen at once. Richard touches my arm. His eyes are bright. Look, he whispers, pointing back behind us. At first, I think I am seeing a vision, that my imagination is playing tricks. I see a dozen native men emerging from the forest near the fort. Some are bare-chested despite the cold, and some have deerskin mantles thrown over one shoulder. They are walking quickly. There is one man among them who is not quite a native, though not quite a man either. His hair is reddish-brown, but long and shaggy. He is wearing a deerskin mantle and also slops and shoes. Suddenly, it is as if my eyes clear, and I know who I am seeing. Captain Smith, I cry, and run full speed to greet him. Everyone starts clamoring at once. They're leaving us. They've stolen our food. We've no stores left. There's no good lazy gentleman. We'll starve. Where have you been? Captain Smith holds up his hands to silence us. Help me with the cannons, he orders. We follow him to the fort, and our soldiers work to load the cannons and aim them squarely at the discovery. Then Captain Smith marches down to the water's edge. Halt or be sunk, he shouts. Disembark at once or die. We watch as the gentlemen on board the ship huddle and talk. After a few minutes of conferring with one another, Master Archer shouts out, where are Jehu Robinson and Thomas Emery? Captain Smith shakes his head. Dead, he answers, killed by the savages. The gentlemen confer some more and then begin to load the longboat with provisions to bring back to shore. A cheer goes up among the commoners. Our food is being returned to us, but I have an uneasy feeling. Why did the gentlemen change their minds as soon as Captain Smith told them that those two men are dead? I watch them paddle in the longboat toward shore and think it almost feels too easy, this change in their plans. We turn our attention to Captain Smith with a hundred questions. Where did you go? Why did you stay away so long? Did you bring corn? Did the Indians try to kill you? Later, he says, I will tell you all about it later. The group of native men who are come with Captain Smith stand quietly watching as the gentlemen roll barrels of provisions up the riverbank. Once the discovery has been unmanned, 
Captain Smith turns back towards the fort. Piagu, he says to the native men. That means to go with him, I say to Richard. Richard and I follow too. Captain Smith brings the men to the fort where two of our cannons sit perched on an art artillery platform. He speaks to them in Algonquin as best as he can. Here, guns I promised to great Powhatan, you take to him. My jaw drops open. We are forbidden to give the Indians muskets or swords, but Captain Smith is giving them a cannon. The Indian men gather around one of the cannons to lift it. They strain, switch positions, team up, push up, and pull with all their might. Their faces turn red, veins on their necks stand out, and they sweat despite the icicles hanging from the trees. I glance over at Captain Smith and see that he is stifling a smile. I give you something easy to carry, he offers. The would-be cannon carriers look relieved. They finally leave with handfuls of intricately colored glass beads, some bells, some small, weird, small mirrors, and a large copper pot. I wonder if the great Powhatan will be satisfied with the switch. Now will you tell us where you've been, John Layden asks. Did you really meet the great Powhatan, I ask? Can a man get breakfast before he has to give an or oration, Captain Smith says. Did you really... Richard and I find the half full barrel of corn and cook up a large pot of hominy. After breakfast, we keep the common cook fire going so we can warn ourselves while Captain Smith tells his story. Most of the common men come to listen. The gentlemen are again nowhere to be seen. Are they off sulking like scalded dogs? I wonder. Or hatching a new plan. But once Captain Smith begins his story, I don't give the gentleman another thought. Two hundred savages came upon me, he says. They captured me and took me prisoner. They paraded me from one village to another, and at each village there were ceremonies and dancing, with dancers painted red and black like fearsome doubles. And there was feasting, lots of feasting. I was sure that as soon as I was fat enough for the liking, they would kill me and eat me. I thought the Powhatans were not cannibals, I blurt out. Captain Smith shakes his head. I didn't think so, but why else were they fattening me up? I ra he raises his eyebrows at me. Finally, I was taken to the village of Wokamoko. I was presented to the Wahun Sanakak, the great Powhatan himself. He sat on a throne covered with a large robe made of raccoon skins, with the tail still on. All around him sat his court, upward of 200 men and women their faces and shoulders painted red and crowns of white bird feathers on their heads. They had another feast, and the two large stones were brought and placed in front of Chief Powhatan. Captain Smith pantomimes, lifting two heavy stones. Suddenly, seven or eight warriors jumped up from the seats and seized me. They dragged me over and forced my head down on one of the stones. Three warriors stood over me with heavy clubs. They raised the clubs, ready to bash my brains out. I suck in my breath. Henry looks at me and rolls his eyes. Well, he didn't get his brains bashed out. Now, did he? He says. I glare at Henry and go back to listening. There was no way for me to escape. So many men holding me down. I could not even move. Captain Smith says, I prepared to die. We are silent, waiting for the next turn in the story. Suddenly, I heard the voice of a child begging for my life to be spared. But Chief Powhatan refused the request. He declared, no, the Englishmen will die. Then I saw who had been speaking. It was a little girl, about nine or ten years old. She came running over to me. She ignored the warriors with their raised clubs. She gathered my head in her arms and laid her own head down over mine. The warriors could not strike a bone blow now without hitting her first. We are amazed by what we have heard. After a moment, Henry breaks the silence. Ah, oh, I don't believe it, he says. You made it all up. You did. Captain Smith is on his feet in a second. He catches Henry up by the front of his shirt. That little girl has more courage than you will ever have. 
and you don't ever call me a liar again. Henry cowers. Yes, sir, he says. I want the story to continue, but just then, President Ratcliffe, Master Martin, Master Archer, and a few of the other gentlemen come crowding into our circle. Several of them grab Captain Smith and hold him fast. We are too stunned to do anything. What is going on here? Captain Smith bellows. He thrashes at the men, but they jerk his arms behind his back, tie his hands together, and clamp shame, chains around his ankles. Stop this, John Layden cries. He lifts his musket, but it is beaten out of his hands by Master Archer. Watch yourself or you'll face the gallows as well, Master Archer. Warns the gallows. You are under arrest, Master Archer announces. The law of Leviticus states an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. You are responsible for the deaths of Thomas Emery and Jehu Robinson. As they were in your care, you will pay for those deaths with your life. Your execution will be at sunup tomorrow. Captain Smith struggles, but he is tied so tightly hand and foot that he can barely move, hardly move. You are mad, he cries. There is no English law that makes me responsible for those deaths. But the gentlemen don't listen. They drag him away, his chains clanking. Rage bubbles up inside me. Without thinking, I snatch up a rock and hurl it straight at the back of Master Archer's head. Master Archer howls. He grabs his bleeding scalp and turns to look at us. I stand there, seething with anger. I feel the old urges, the desire to punch and rip to see blood before the fu my fury is spent. Captain Smith's voice speaks in my head. Learn to channel your anger, Samuel, and it will become your strength rather than your weakness. I know what they're doing, Henry is saying. They'll kill Captain Smith, and then they'll go ahead and sail away and leave us to starve. Channel my anger? No. I can't stop myself. I run at Master Archer. I will knock him down and pummel the snot out of him. And that concludes chapter 15. Quite a interesting chapter. Today I wanted to talk about prepositions. I feel prepositions are one item that sometimes kids forget about. And prepositions start prepositional phrases. So here are a couple examples of prepositions. In, on, under, next to, behind, in front of, between. A preposition is a word which shows the relationship between a noun or a pronoun and some other word in the sentence. For example, in Delhi, of her success. There's three kinds of prepositions. There's preposition of place and direction, prepositions of time and date, and prepositions of travel and movement. We have three discussion questions today. My first question is, why did the gentleman want to leave? Well, the gentlemen want to leave because I think they're finding it very rough to live on the East Atlantic Ocean, that it is a little bit harder to survive. They've gone through sickness. They've gone through not having much food. They've gone through savages or the Native Americans attacking them. And all of these have led up to the point where the gentlemen want to leave. Your two chapters. Your two discussion questions are, what happened between the Indians and John Smith? And who arrives on a new ship? Think about that. Who is it arriving? I want to continue with the government talk. So I want to talk about the types of government and who participates in it. So our government is a democracy. A government where the people are the highest authority and have all the power in the government. So we have people in charge of our government. And there's two types of democracies. There's a direct democracy. The people vote on every law and decision that rule of government. That's not the way our government works for the most part, unless it comes to city rule, city government. We go with the indirect form. The people elect representatives to vote and make laws for them. For example, we vote in our mayor, we vote in our governor, our House of Representatives, and our Senate members. And we also vote for the president. The basic concepts of democracy is each individual has worth 
and they are allowed to have their own individual opinion. Everyone has an equal opportunity to be treated equally before the law. The majority must listen to the minority, so there is not someone that cannot be listened to. We all have a voice, and nothing can happen without compromise. So in government, there's often compromises and votes, and we have to go with the democratic way, with the majority. Everyone has their own freedoms, but not unlimited freedoms. We do have some control. As they say, we need life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So no one's pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness should be affected by another person in that democracy. Hope you enjoyed chapter 15. We're almost at the end of the school year. Enjoy.